what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. This podcast is sponsored by Jackson Creative, a custom communication agency located in downtown Hickory, North Carolina, specializing in online content creation. To learn more, visit thejacksoncreative.com. Jackson Creative, we tell your story. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. My name is Alan Jackson, co-director and co-founder of the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival. With me across the table, Chris Fry, also co and co of those two titles I yes. just mentioned. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing well. Hello, podcast listeners. Yes, we've got an exciting show today. This is our film review and discussion show here on TheMesh.TV. And Chris, let me go ahead and hit the lineup of what we're going to be tackling in today's episode, all right? Okay. So as usual, we have a couple of reviews to discuss, brand new films that we want to share our thoughts with you about. First up will be the latest film from Eddie Murphy, premiering on Netflix, it is Dolomite Is My Name. Uh, you're not going to say that in no, care? No, no I, I'm going to leave that to Mr. Murphy. Okay. I, I don't know if I could pull that off quite as well. Gotcha. He is uh, playing true life famed entertainer Rudy Ray Moore in this film. Uh, as I said, exclusively on Netflix uh, premiering, but we'll be talking about it here on the show. Followed by the review of the film Loose, uh, starring Naomi Watts and Octavia Spencer. Uh, Interesting film that we'll be discussing. Probably a very little-known film, but one that will be available for everybody to check out online here very soon. Then, Chris, we've got a couple of interesting uh, news-related items to discuss in today's episode. Uh, First off, I will be ranting about something. Um, It's not really – well, it is news-related. It's about something in the news related – Two films in the movie industry. Hmm. It's just got me angry, and I just want to kind of talk about it. So <laughs> I'm a little bit of to a hear slanted news item there, but I will be ranting on something uh, very uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, They're not sure. making a Smurfs three. <laughs> now don't now don't ruin it. Don't spoil okay. my rant. Okay. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit after our reviews, and then also. It's kind of fun. Uh, Chris Fry, who is normally very adverse to watching trailers for films that he's anticipating to preserve every bit of surprise he can, or at least when he sees the trailer in a movie theater when he's kind of forced to, we're going to throw all that out the window. <laughs> and Chris Fry is going to live watch on this show the latest Star Wars Episode Nine trailer. I mean, it's all for the listeners. That's so you're gonna, we're going to watch it? Yeah. I've already seen it. I have my thoughts on it. I have not been able to say anything to Chris about it, even (laughs) though he works in the office right next door to me. But now Chris has volunteered to watch the trailer on the show and give us his initial thoughts as soon as the trailer goes goes against everything I believe in, but it's for the, but it is for the show. So it was all the show. show. Then we'll end up the show with our recommendations of the episode where you and I both give out a recommendation of a film that we think people ought to check out, or maybe they might've missed could be a newer film, could be one available online, something we want to recommend for people going into the weekend or something they have some extra time, something they may want to check out. So, Chris, we got a jam-packed episode. I'm ready to get started if you are. Yes, let's do it. All right. First up, then, is going to be our review of the latest Netflix original film. It is Dolomite Is My Name. It's showtime, y'all. You love him and I love him. Put your hands together. Dolomite is my name. Alan, I'm going to talk about Mr. Murphy's filmography. And although, listeners, you cannot see this, I would like for you to raise your hand mm-hmm. when you have seen a film of the, his. Okay? All right. It all we're depends go, on what, what era nope, you're going in, but that's fine. We're going in reverse oh, no. chronological order. This is so, really bad, then. Mr. Church. Have not. Beverly Hills Cop, the TV movie that was released in 2013. Nope. I didn't even realize this existed. Yes, it does. And I did not see it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shrek's Thrilling Tales. No. Okay. A Thousand Words. No. Tower Heist. Nope. Shrek's Yule Log. Nope. Donkey's Christmas Shrektacular. Nope. Shrek Forever After. 
I think I maybe have seen that in passing. It wasn't an intentional watch, but I do think I've seen part of it. Okay, so part of it. Yeah. Okay, so in 2010, so nine years ago is the last time you saw something of Mr. Murphy's work. I believe that's correct. Okay, let's go, let's see if we can go a little farther sure. to get a complete film on the on the record here. Yeah. Uh, imagine that. No. Meet Dave. No. Shrek the Halls. No. Shrek the Third. Okay, maybe that was the one I actually saw. I don't think I saw that, that Shrek Forever. That was the fourth one. Uh, Shrek Forever After would have been. I don't I think. think I've seen the fourth one, so I'm going to go back to Shrek the Third. Okay, so 2007. Okay, so that's 12 years. 12 years hiatus for Alan and Mr. Murphy's relationship. Yeah, okay. sounds about right. I just just wanted to, just wanted to clarify that. Yes. Okay, so with Dolomite is my name, this biography comedy drama. Eddie Murphy plays the real-life legend Rudy Ray Moore. He's a comedy rap pioneer who proved naysayers wrong when his hilarious, obscene, kung fu fighting alter ego Dolomite became a 1970s black exploitation phenomenon. So, you've had kind of a cool relationship over 12 years with Mr. Murphy. Um, we have talked on the podcast in news segments about how. You know, we were curious, would like for him to kind of have a return to form, Mm -hmm. would like to see him on the big screen again. This isn't on, I mean, you can see it in some bigger cities, but it's the Mm -hmm. smaller screen of Netflix. But how do you feel like his return into your film watching, Mm -hmm. how how do you feel like it fared? Uh, Eddie Murphy um, fit like a glove. Okay. Almost like he didn't go away. Um, I had a lot of fun with this film, Uh, and it's mainly because Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy was kind of performing at the level that I think I was used to seeing 15, 18 years ago. Uh, and it's almost like he didn't really leave. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't even imagine that there was a 12, 15-year gap of time where he really wasn't producing a lot of great content. So um, it was great. It was nice seeing him back up on the screen. Um, this seemed like a role that was almost custom-made for him, even though it's based on a true story. Uh, you have someone who... Um, you know, there's a lot of parallels with Eddie Murphy's life to some degree, kind of this idea of starting out being a very kind of getting known for being very raunchy and raw and and both comedian, but then getting into a lot of different forms, getting into acting and wanting to make a movie. Of course, the difference was with Eddie Murphy when he hit the scene back in the early eighties. I mean, it was pretty explosive. It was, I don't think he had to go too, too long before he became very, very big on Saturday Night Live then um, uh, 48 Hours, Beverly Hills Cop, on and on. Sure. So this one's similar, but it's almost a reverse, where this is a guy later in life who never really got the fame he think he's expected and now find, kind of finally finds his niche, a way to get attention and how much he's going to build it up around him. This film to me is... Uh, th- there's two films I, I draw a lot of parallels to, and I feel like it's better than one of them and not as good as the other. So it's somewhere okay. in the middle of these two. Uh, I feel like it is not as good as Ed Wood, the Tim Burton film, okay. which I desperately love and I think is a great film about a true Hollywood icon character that just has fun with the story as well. It's not as good as Ed Wood, but I do think it's better than The Disaster Artist, the uh, James Franco uh, retelling of The Room that was from a couple Those years ago. are two very interesting touchdowns. Well, and it's very similar in that sure. it, it covers a real-life person making a real-life work of art. And this was, you know, uh, Dolomite was kind of the creation of Rudy Ray Moore. I enjoyed it more than The Disaster Artist. I think it was probably a little better made. I think it dug a little deeper into the story than I, I, something I wish The Disaster Artist had done a little more. But still doesn't reach that Ed Wood height of showing me a real Hollywood biopic in a really interesting storytelling way. So I had a lot of fun with it. I thought it was funny. Uh, there were some moments that were downright hilarious. Um, but it was also a touching film, too. I thought there were some nice tender moments. I, I want to call out a, a few later on in the, in the review. Okay. I thought acting-wise and performance-wise were really good. But um, overall, I really had a good time with it. I thought it was a, a great return to form for Mr. Murphy. So I'm giving it a, a positive review here. So Chris, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on this. Yeah. I'd, likewise. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a fun watch. You know, it's very light films, not really heavy. Yeah. I was kind of surprised at some of the warm hearted nature mm-hmm. of kind of 
his relationship with one of the characters, you're kind of like, wow, he's really genuinely caring about this person. It was, I I wasn't expecting that Mm -hmm. going into the movie. All I kind of knew was the Barry boilerplate. Yeah. Dolomite is this character. They made movies. It was black exploitation. And that's kind of all I knew to kind of learn some of the background that we do about him being kind of a failed stand up artist, Mm -hmm. a musician. He tried to do that. It didn't work. And to see how he kind of gets this idea of basically taking stories that were told by like, you know, people just like kind of jokes about pimps and prostitutes mm-hmm. and kind of like, you know, it's like your mama jokes, except very filthy guys on the street. <laughs> so kind of some older right. guys, like some, like some homeless guys and some other guys that just live on the street stories. They were telling, he was taking those stories and turning them into entertainment. So, and yeah. so to weave that together and kind of to have that idea of like, yeah, these are all things that we kind of hear and we laugh about, but then to turn that into a stand up to act and then to turn it into like a film idea that just, yeah, it was just, it was interesting to see kind of a spin on, there are no original ideas, just how you express that ideas mm-hmm. and how he was able to do that. I'd, I thought it was pretty cool. And I had no, no idea that that was the case. Yeah. So then you mentioned too, just watching it the whole time, because we've talked about Murphy's hiatus from, um, very well-known films for the last mm-hmm. couple of years and just kind of the parallel with Rudy Ray Moore and how, like, later in his life he finds this, you know, fame. Murphy's had fame, obviously, but for him to come around and do this film about this guy who you just can't help but think he holds in some high esteem because it's like, yeah, yeah he had comedy. Some people didn't approve of how the language or some of the rough nature, because he tried to do comedy albums, and people were like, we're not going to put this filth out there. Nobody's mm-hmm. going to buy it. And it ended up, no, that wasn't the case. It was kind of an underground market Murphy, I know that he's had kind of a weird relationship with Bill Cosby, and they kind of talk about that kind of very glancingly. Um, he referenced Dolomite <laughs> references Bill Cosby, yeah. and you know, even when uh, they had that reunion special type thing for Saturday Night Live, mm-hmm. and they had Eddie Murphy on there, and they wanted him to do this huge thing, and he ended up kind of not doing it, kind of just saying like, "I'm Bill Cosby," and then just kind of like he did something. It was just very. Yeah. He, he he has stayed away from stand up. He has stayed away from doing kind of his the traditional comedy that you would know him for for a really long time. Right. And so and it was um, just it was interesting to see just all these things kind of coming together and making this movie. Um and I yeah, he was Eddie Murphy for me was the best thing about the film. Oh yeah. Um without a doubt. Yeah. Um I've referenced, you know, kind of some of the warm hearted notes that they hit, and that has to do with the character the character was Lady Reed, but played mm-hmm. by Divine Joy Randolph. She's kind of like his comedic foil. She's an ex backup singer who he kind of makes a friendship with. She ends up in the movie, and you know they're kind of, they kind of play off each other. And she kind of you know has this deadpan comedic foil nature with mm-hmm. him. And I I really enjoyed her. I wasn't familiar with her from any other films, so she was also kind of like a discovery for me of like, oh, that's that's cool. Yeah, no, she was great. I, I agree. Eddie Murphy, I do think he made the movie. I do think some of the supporting cast got some really good turns. But I also think there's a lot of supporting there's cast. There's a lot. And I feel like that's one problem with the film is that there's so many talented uh, actors in this cast that not not many of them get a chance to shine. Sure. Um, I'll say the ones that I don't feel like get a chance to shine. Craig Robinson plays kind of a member of his crew and yeah, he gets a couple moments, maybe a song he gets to sing and that's about it. Right. Chris he, Rock does a little more of a cameo in there, which is fine. You know, I think it was designed as a cameo. Titus Burgess, who I think is really funny in um, uh, the Kimmy Schmidt uh, mm-hmm. uh, series on Netflix. It didn't really give, get a lot to do with the film here. No. It's disappointing that you have some really good, talented actors and comedians that didn't get to do a lot. Keegan Michael Key, who I really like as well, I felt like kind of was given a, a, a really kind of a throwaway part that he could have played in the sleep, and it just didn't really do a lot for me. However, all that being said, okay. Wesley Snipes playing Dur- Durville Martin as an actor who's now going to become a director of the film, I thought was really good. I thought it was the most I've seen Wesley Snipes act and have fun acting. He clearly was having a oh, lot of fun. For a, the whole duration of the film was really good. So I'm going to give him props to say that was a great performance. That was really fun. So Eddie Murphy and Wesley Snipes were the two for me who really made this film work. And I agree with you about um, uh, 
uh, Devin Joy Randolph was also really, really strong as kind of a debut or someone I hadn't seen in any other work before. Right. Um, it, it was it was a good, fun film. It it did hit some of the traditional biopic beats, and you know, um, it could have chosen to be a little more daring in some places, and, and it didn't. Uh, I felt like it played it pretty straight straight down the line as far as a biopic goes. But the nice thing was is that when you've got some really great you know scenes of, of trying to make this film Dolomite, and you know such a low budget, strung together film with a bunch of people who had no idea how to make a movie. <laughs> That automatically lends itself to some great comedy, even though you know exactly where the film's going to go. You know that there's still going to be you know, some success to some degree that people are going to realize. It doesn't matter. It was fun watching the ride get there. So uh, it wasn't the most creative biopic. It wasn't the most uh, um, unique or uh, really original take on the story. But it was a lot of fun, and it was really carried by some strong acting in those two roles I, I identified. So, yeah. Do you have any any misgivings? Anything with the film you felt like didn't work as well? Well, I'll do I'll do one more positive, okay. and then I'll do a misgiving. We've kind of touched on. I agree with the kind of the huge ensemble cast and not everybody being served and kind of being yeah. distracting, maybe in mm-hmm. a little way. So I would second that. The positive I'll say is you know the costume design, the set design, oh, yeah. the score and music, and the cinematography. All that work t- to give this film the film the look that it needed to like go along with to flow with Murphy's performance. Kind of, you know, it's very period, obviously. Yeah. And I thought all that was like, you know, meticulous and really well done. So that all helped kind of set the mood, create the mood for the film. So that really worked for me. Um, the misgivings they kind of go hand in hand. The script to me felt a little undercooked yeah. at some points, and mm-hmm. that kind of I think that was what didn't serve some of the cameo appearances and supporting actors it just kind of you kind of it had a great start and it had a good finish but the middle was just kind of muddy so script wise maybe and i think also here again you talk about expectations which we haven't even mentioned this person yet which that's part of the problem the director is Mm -hmm. craig brewer he who did hustle and flow and black snake snake moon two films that i like and I was hoping for something a little bit more unique yeah. style wise, but instead his Brewer's direction was capable, but it was just very pedestrian. And so well, nothing stood out to me directing wise. You're right. right. Which I will say it was a little bit of a disappointment because I, I black snake moan is one of my favorite films. Hustle and flow is really strong. Um, granted since those two, I don't think he's done a whole lot, you know, footloose, the remake of footloose back in 2011, I think was the last big film he did if i'm seeing right he's done a lot of tv since then mm-hmm. so now dolomite is my name is the kind of his return to filmmaking after eight years um empire was the big thing i think he was involved with that tv show that okay. was on kind of helping get that show started so uh yeah the directing was nothing special again and, and it really kind of forced it into a very typical biopic format where I just didn't feel like, I, like you said on the writing, there just wasn't anything surprising or unique that really made this story stand out more than others. Again, if it wasn't for the subject matter, Rudy Ray Moore and the whole Dolomite character that he created in the film, which was all true, and if it wasn't for Eddie Murphy injecting life in this film, there wouldn't be a lot there. So right. it kind of relies so much on the actual subject matter and your lead actor to carry this film. Yeah, I can't um, imagine anybody else playing the no. Rooney Ray Moore character and this movie working. So yeah. it's kind of perfect marriage of role and actor. And it's and I got a comment too. So a couple things about Eddie Murphy because he is he, he. I grew up with Eddie Murphy. I love Eddie Murphy. I think he's hilarious when he wants to be hilarious. He hasn't made a rated R movie. I don't think since. Oh my gosh! I can't one even of those Shrek what movies the last, that I literally. Every movie he's made in the last 15 years, I think, has been PG or, or PG-13, maybe. But he just hasn't really cut himself loose. Right. Um, returning back to his roots of the type of comedy he got known for. And then there's the idea of prosthetics. He's always been someone who seems to be really enjoy getting the makeup work done to look like somebody else. For things like Norbit or The Nutty Professor. Yeah. yeah. Here, there is a little prosthetics. There's a little makeup to give him a little... <laughs> pudgier a little older look it's really subtle it's really slight it's not distracting and it works you know for his for the character um so 
it's a little return to form, and I'm happy with that. I, I, I like Eddie Murphy cut loose and <laughs> swearing and being raunchy and all. That's <laughs> that's great. That works for sure. for this type of film. So it was a perfect marriage. I, I think uh, I wish the film could have been written a little stronger and have a little more punch to it. But it was a, definitely an entertaining film to watch and uh, a lot of fun. And I definitely laughed many, many times throughout the, uh, the running time. So. so I'm curious, kind of closing out the review, which kind of a going forward type thing, uh, coming to America, and that's two mm. instead of the word T-O, coming to America will be directed by Craig Brewer yes. and starring Mr. Eddie Murphy and is going to be coming out. I don't know if it's 2020 or 2021, yeah. but it, it's it's upcoming, as is Beverly Hills Cop 4, which yeah. there's not a director tied to that, I don't believe. What do you what do you think about that? Well, I I'm nervous about the return into these properties. And I'll give you a main reason why. When I was in college, I believe, Beverly Hills Cop 3 came out. Okay. Now, if I remember correctly, and you can spot check me on IMDb here, I believe Beverly Hills Cop 3 was directed by John Landis. Okay. And it was supposed to have been a little bit of a return for Eddie Murphy because I think he hadn't really had a hit in a few years. And that movie was horrible. I remember going to see it, paying my hard in college level income money hmm. to see it, and it was absolutely garbage. And I, I think that set him back quite a bit and kind of put him back on that. I, I feel like that might have forced him down the path of, I'm G-rated just going to do Disney PG. and Disney level kids movies because I can make more money that way and be more successful. So I'm nervous, you know, about returning to either of those franchises. Um, but we'll see. You know, it could be. I mean, there have been some good examples of returning to an older franchise and coming up with a really good installment and kind of getting it back on track. So who knows? It could could work. I just want Eddie back on the screen. <laughs> I want him back on the screen in some really fun roles and not feeling like he's got to he's got to uh, do the Shrek or Disney thing to keep keep things going. Well, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Um, and you were correct. John Landis did direct Beverly yeah, Hills Cop. What do you know? That's another thing that was so disappointing about that film. Because, you know, John Landis is a good comedic director. and um, Boy, that movie was just not, not fun at all. I remember that. <laughs> all right. So that's Dolomite Is My Name, directed by Craig Brewer, starring Mr. Eddie Murphy. It is on Netflix right now. So if you have Netflix, you can click a couple buttons and find it and watch it. Uh, if you don't have Netflix, Chris, let me ask you this. If, if somebody doesn't have Netflix, is this worth a one-month Netflix subscription to pay $10 to see this or $9 or whatever it is for Netflix for a month? Or would you I mean, say – if, if you can get in and out of Netflix for $9, if that's you know, just for a month, I mean, and you're, you like Eddie Murphy? Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe, because that's it. cheaper than actually going to the if movie this theater. this sounds like your kind of comedy, this yeah. whole behind-the-scenes Hollywood and raunchy humor and Eddie Murphy, then, yeah, it's worth the 9 bucks or whatever for a month of Netflix. Okay. Sure. Good deal. Let's go ahead and move on to our second review, which is a, a very different film. It is a drama, uh, a very new drama, uh, starring Naomi Watts and Octavia Spencer. The film is Loose. When I first met my mother, she couldn't pronounce my name. My father suggested that they rename me. They picked loose, which means light. If you Googled model student, Luce Edgar's picture would come up on the computer. Given Luce's background, you and Peter must have faced quite a few challenges. The language barrier, the culture shock. I mean, you don't pull a kid out of a war zone and have him turn out like Luce without a lot of help. Which is why this is so difficult. So, Chris, with Luce, we have the story of a married couple that's being forced to reckon with their idealized image of their son. He's an adopted son they've named Luce. Comes from a war-torn country of Eritrea. And after there's a discovery uh, by a high school teacher of Luce, uh, it threatens his status as an all-star student. Uh, This is a film, Chris, that you and I... uh, elected to bring to our film society and show for a couple of screenings that we knew really nothing about. Uh, I think maybe the trailer, maybe uh, the little synopsis we read online uh, was getting some decent reviews. So we thought it might be one to bring. And we always pride ourselves on trying to bring films and talk have films that are worth discussion. And right. I think if nothing else, whether you tell me you like this film or not, I think we, we you got to admit this is a film that prompts discussion. And we certainly had 
two nights worth of discussion and our two nights of screening from my understanding of our film society Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. So with this film, Chris, let me just ask you, I mean, it, the, the description I gave kind of glances at a high level of what the film is about, but it does start to traipse into some other areas. It deals with some issues of uh, judging of children and the role parents play in crafting and helping and assisting those children. It also starts to go into some other areas of, uh, I mean, there's even touch on mental illness and relationships within families that could become fractured. So tell me what you thought of this film. Did it try to do too much as a film? Did it try to go too deep on its subject uh, without paying off? Or do you feel like it, it warrants the ending and the, the, the way the film all came together as a package in the end? This is probably one of the few examples I can think of where a film is trying to do so much, so many different issues. I mean, I can tack on racial stereotyping, Mm -hmm. adoption, challenges of adopting, you know, children, challenges of adopting children from another country. I mean, there are just so many topics. And I think this is a rare instance for me where it wasn't too much. Mm. Um, It actually all worked as a cohesive whole. Now that's not to say sometimes I was like, wait, what just happened? And how, how is this all intertwining? I I've only seen this movie once, but I could watch it. It's kind of a hard watch in many instances, but I could totally see myself watching it again um, because there's there's just so much going on up Mm -hmm. on the screen. I, I wonder, I knew this going in that it was, based on a play. Yeah. And I wonder if that kind of helps how tight the structure is, despite mm-hmm. all it's trying to do. Um, it was based on a play by JC Lee who helped with the screenplay as well, but it was directed by Julius Ona mm-hmm. and the dialogue really crackles. The scenes, you know, just come right after each other. There's never for me, there was never a dull moment. This movie was an hour and 49 minutes and there wasn't a moment, a second wasted. Yeah. Um, it was just really, it was really impressive, a really impressive watch for me. And one that you, like you said, I didn't really know much about. Mm-hmm. So what were your thoughts? No, I think we're, we're on a similar path there. I, I did appreciate it quite a bit. I was surprised by kind of how I went in with a very bare bones expectation of what this film is going to be about. And I was surprised how much deeper it got in some issues. Um, I think a film like this, you got to look to the lead actor, uh, Calvin Harrison Jr., who I thought was really, really good. He as plays Luce, Luce, Luce. Right. Um, To play someone that is a different person to different people around him and still pull that off and where you never quite have the best hand on exactly what is going on in his brain for most of the running time of the film, but it works and you totally buy the fact that you don't always know. Um, I, I think it was a great performance. And I think everybody else on the cast did a great job as well. Octavia Spencer, it's pretty impressive. I oh, thought yeah. she was really good as Harriet Wilson, the high school teacher that is the first one to start to voice her concerns about Luce as a student where everybody else in the world sees him as this just perfect, perfect student, perfect model of what a student should be. And the, the there's enough elements of mystery that you never know really where it's going. You never really know who is uh, in the right or wrong. And the film pulls off the good feet of saying that, you know, not, I'm not spoiling anything with it, but to actually say this, it's never that clear and it's never that uh, clean of a distinction uh, for everybody in the, in the film. Um, What I thought was interesting about this film is the, the takeaway people can have from it. And again, just going back to the conversations, I think you may have had very similar ones on the second night of our screening. I I wasn't there in person. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting how the audience was split between everybody feeling one character is to blame for what happens in the film, where other part of the audience is feeling these other people are to blame for what's happening. And the fact of the matter is, they're all right. Mm -hmm. And It's not an easy answer. Not an easy answer. But it does prompt those kind of emotions from the film. So I... uh, I thought it was really good. It was a really interesting surprise. Um, acted well across the board. I thought the pacing and directing was was good in that the directing wasn't distracting. It didn't try to become a visually uh, impressive film. It let the acting and the story move everything, but it moved. Like you said, there really wasn't a down moment where I felt like it kind of stalled at any point. Um, 
and it was a, an interesting build up too. I mean, it builds to a last few scenes that still doesn't give you any perfect clarification. It's not designed to, but it's a wonderful build up to where it's going. And by the end, you start to see some of the pieces coming together and understanding what the story is about and what the story is trying to tell us. So there, I'm going to say that Kelvin Harrison, who, like you mentioned, he plays loose. I think he, this performance has all the panache of Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, but not the hype. Mm -hmm. And I think he deserves a best actor nod for this performance. I can see that. Um, And you could boil it down to, there are basically three scenes, um, one at the beginning of the film, one maybe in the middle, and then one definitely at the end. And it's him giving a speech. Mm -hmm. And the, the differences between him giving the speech those three different times is just, I mean, it's like a master class. It's really amazing. And he does great work throughout the rest of the film too, but just little nuances. And in a way, it's one of those things where, you know, people talk about scene, scenery chewing and, you know, you have something like Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood, or you have Joaquin Phoenix and the Joker. And the performances are big mm-hmm. and showy. And then you have something like this that, yeah, Luce has some big moments, but it's more of the smaller quieter, like simmering beneath the surface that are just really amazing. Yeah. And I think really deserve notice. I completely agree. There are many noticeable or, or noteworthy scenes in the film. I think there's a scene for me that happens towards the end of the film. It's not the final parts of the film, but probably in the last third, um, a meeting between principal, teacher, parents, and loose hmm. in a room, not not uh, uh, not uh, uh, coincidentally in a room, glass uh, covered room where right. fish bowls and fish are very much a a visual theme that goes throughout the film of people living in a fish bowl and all that. Right. Anyway, there's a scene there that kind of is, I guess you could call it a little bit of a climax, but there's still stuff afterwards. But that's where you really have all the key players together and you start to get a little understanding of what's going on. You know, interesting. That is a really good scene. The one, you know, I I actually don't have any faults with this film except for, I don't know, do they have that instance more than once or is that instance kind of what you're describing that only happens once? Uh, what what the the principal room with the parents, the teacher? That only happens okay, one okay, time. Okay, so yeah, it is yeah. the same scene mm-hmm. I'm thinking of. Okay, a character in that scene basically throws some other people under the bus. Oh yeah, and a person knows that she's doing that and is okay with it or maybe not yeah. okay with it, but just something about that, the whole rest of the film I just think is flawless and something about how quick that happened rang a little, I don't want to say false. Cause I can say, yeah, you know, in the heat of the moment, I guess, yeah. it, but something about it just rang a little hollow to me. And maybe it's the eternal optimist in me that makes yeah. me have struggle with it. But something about that just seemed a little bit too. It is immediate. one character that kind of takes a, takes a turn and performs an action that, you know, automatically casts her in a more negative light as a viewer. But yet at the same time, you can also see where that character is coming from at the moment too. So it's, I don't know. It's uh, tough. It's, it's a tough, yeah. it's a tough turn without spoiling stuff. It's yeah, yeah. A, um, something, you know, I was mentioning the writing and we've talked about the acting, you know, just there's so much to think about and unpack with this film. And it's something as simple as the title. Uh, you heard in the little bit of the trailer that we played, one of the definitions for loose was Italian for light. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there's another definition, if you look it up, that's it's a type of pike fish notorious yeah. for its appetite and large pointed teeth. So mm-hmm. not what you would call a positive take on the term or the name loose. And then in our audience, after the screening, somebody, I kind of brought that up and somebody brought up a third instance of what they had thought. And from what I understand, somebody brought that up at your screening as yeah. well, that they thought loose was just short because it's spelled L-U-C-E short for or hinting towards Lucifer, Lucifer. which is interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it might be a bit of a stretch. Might I be. think the pike fish example is probably a little more fitting. But uh, it's interesting uh, that two different yeah. individuals at the screen, I saw people nodding their heads, yeah. and I had not even occurred to me. So. No, no, I, I think it was fascinating to hear people's takes afterwards. I mean, you know, again, it was pretty evenly split. Half the crowd says, this individual, this person, this they were doing everything that was wrong. 
and everybody else is just trying to work around it. And then you've got other people saying, no, all these other people were doing things to facilitate this happening. And, you know, this will other individuals not at fault at all. It's his upbringing. It, it was just interesting dynamics to look at. And, uh, again, I love any film that can kind of spark that kind of debate and conversation and get people thinking about things. So, um, yeah, we also had Tim Roth starring as the father, Peter Egger, which I thought he played an interesting part in that he had to be the cool father and kind of to go along with his wife, Naomi Watts playing his wife, Amy, but yet there's some fracture there. There's some, there's some distance between the two of them and watching that interplay and affect how they work as a, as a family unit was also really interesting. And yeah, and then several of the classmates, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of young actors playing the classmates of loose also all really good and strong. I thought so, uh, uh, performances top to bottom, I thought really, really matched in the film. I, I, I touched on a little bit of um, some of the things I've liked about the film, and I can't remember if I've called it out or not, but the, I want to be sure I emphasize some of the cinematography and the way the film shot. Like you mentioned, they have some fish bowls, they have glass, like mm-hmm. cubicles, and all these things. So it's, it's like you're always staring in it caged or trapped mm-hmm. individuals, which was interesting. Something else, which, like I say, I've only seen the film once, but I noticed, and when I mentioned it in the discussion, other people kind of nodded their heads um, that they'd noticed too, and they weren't sure what was up with it. But now I've come to terms with it, and I like to think it's on purpose. I don't know. We'll have to find out someday. But a lot of times, things seem to be out of focus. Mm -hmm. And specifically, the character that I noticed, because it was his face, Tim Roth, for the first like 20 or 30 minutes of the film, he always seemed to be out of focus and he would be talking sometimes and not be in focus. And it wasn't like he was way out of focus. It was just like he was slightly out of focus. This is a smaller independent film. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, maybe they just didn't have the money to go back and do pickups and all that kind of stuff. Cause it would be like conversations between he and Naomi Watts or him and Luz, you know, just sometimes he was just like not as crisp in focus as the other person in the frame. And it wasn't like they would do a rack focus. But then what came out through the discussion and my thoughts was that I think that was on purpose. Mm -hmm. And what they did is whoever was the dominant person would be the one that was always in focus. Now, if you had two dominant people, Naomi Watts, Luce, or Naomi Watts' character and Luce, they would they would actually do the normal shifting of okay focus on her, then sharp focus on him, then go back and forth. Yeah. But there's some scenes of the early scenes of um, Luce, Tim Roth and Naomi Watts in the car, his parents in the car. Luz can be in focus, and Naomi Watts can be in focus, but the father character, Tim Ross character, is never in sharp focus, even mm-hmm. when he's talking sometimes. And it's like, you're not important. Yeah. You're not the boss. Interesting. And there's some interesting power dynamics. Octavia Spencer has some instances, too, where she is kind of blurry at some points, but then starts to be in sharp focus. I know I, I feel like there was some intentional... I focus things that. going on. I think I, I, I would be surprised if it was. And I would so. think I was just making all of it up. But if you, when you start digging into what you think this film means, yeah. you can say like, nope, that, that seems to kind of track right with what the film is trying to say. Something else that's kind of interesting is that how people interpret what is going on in the film kind of seems to say more, a lot of times seems to say more about their perspective and who they are as opposed to what the film is actually saying. Because in a way, the film's Mm -hmm. kind of not a blank slate because obviously there's writing and acting going on, but it's like you can read into a lot of people's personal experiences of what they're kind of projecting onto the film. It was just really, I don't know, it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating watch, a perfect film for a film society like we had to, to watch and discuss. Uh, Julius Ona, the director um, kind of interesting. He's only really done one other big movie. And I've seen it. You've seen it. Have you? No. The Cloverfield <laughs> Paradox. Yeah, which was that advertised was, during the Super Bowl. It was a Netflix release film, kind right. of a surprise thing. Did not do too well. People did not care for it. It was kind of savage pretty brutally from what I remember. And I, I don't lay that at his feet. Okay. Um, I saw it, and I didn't think the direction was the problem with it. I don't know if he also wrote the script. Um, but... Uh, yeah, and the acting was fine in it, um, but yeah, it, it definitely was. He did not write. This, he did not write. He just directed. Right. So I, you know, before that film, he had just been doing short films and music videos and other things. So I think this is his first. It, those were his first two big, you know, theatrical productions. So, gotcha. So, um, hopefully, Loose is a much more kind of where he he is as an artist and a director. So sure, and I, I think something else that. 
I think is worth mentioning um, to people who have seen the film or people that are going to see the film. You know, you mentioned how Luce is from Eritrea, and that's a very like you know war torn country that's had a lot of um, mm-hmm. fighting and a lot of killing and stuff. Um, interestingly to me, Julius Ona, the director, he was born in Nigeria. Oh. Hmm. And um, so I wonder if some of his life experiences or just his interest in the material came from some of his background. Like, you know, Very he was possible. kind of interested in putting yeah. that on screen. So, yeah, it's, to me, fascinating watch. I uh, highly recommend it. No, well, I'm, I'm with you on that, too. I, 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 uh, I appreciated it. Uh, I can't say I enjoyed it. It's more of a, I truly appreciate it as a film. And love the kind of conversation it just, it prompts from people who watch it. So that is loose. Uh, didn't get much of a theatrical run, so probably going to be something available online here in the next uh, couple months, I would say. And I hope something from it gets a little bit of I gets know. a little bit of love. Come I know. It's if, a long, nothing, if nothing else, I know it's a long haul. Yeah. A, um, adapted screenplay, you know, to take a play yeah. and ad- adapt it from something. I just, I feel like this has to at least be in the running, yeah. but you would hope so. It's yeah. just, unfortunately hasn't gotten a lot of buzz sure. in any direction on anything, but, uh, loose, we are both recommending, highly recommending things worth a watch and we encourage you to check it out. Okay. We're going to take a quick break after our two reviews. When we come back two 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 novel things we're going to be doing me <laughs> Getting, stepping up on my soapbox, I'm going to go get the soapbox from the other room, Chris, and have awesome. that set up ready to go. We'll do that, and then we'll also do the live viewing of the new Star Wars trailer exclusively for Mr. Chris Fry, who has not seen it yet, and we'll get his initial reactions. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with Foot Candle Films here on The Mesh in just a moment. U.S. Health Advisors want you to know your health coverage does not have to be complicated. If you aren't happy with your insurance plan, there are unlimited and comprehensive medical plan options available to you right now. U.S. Health Advisors offer solutions which can't be found anywhere else. They can even offer you the ability to purchase more coverage if and when you need it. U.S. Health Advisors offers fair rates and no surprises. Sounds nice, doesn't it? If you'd like to know more, contact the U.S. Health Advisors at 828 554 3032 or by email at daniel.bryant at ushadvisors.com. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on the mesh.tv. Uh, Alan and Chris back with you after having had our two reviews of the films Dolomite is My Name and Loose. Both, we are giving strong recommendations to both of them on. Loose sounds like it really kind of hit some great positive notes for you. Same here as well. But two good films that we do encourage people to check out. Uh, if you uh, sound interested after hearing the reviews we shared with you. Now it's a part of the show where we do go into more of our movie news. We talk a little bit more about just some either projects that are underway or things happening in the movie world. But Chris, uh, I'm kind of breaking a little bit with that. Okay. You know, we haven't talked about superheroes in this show. And technically we're still not really going to. Okay. But this story does have something to do with the superhero movies of late. <laughs> and unfortunately, it has to do with uh, a story dealing with one of my favorite directors of all time, Mr. Martin Scorsese. Okay. So, oh, I think I know where this is going now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So, here's the situation for anybody who's I'm not I'm interested to aware. hear your take on how you feel about oh, it. Oh, I have a take. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Martin Scorsese, wonderful director, one of my absolute favorites, has The Irishman coming out on Netflix, which I'm also very excited to see here in the next little bit. Um, while doing press for his Netflix release, uh, made the comment that Marvel movies, the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, are not cinema. His quote was, honestly, the closest I can think of them, as well as ma- as well made as they are, with actors doing the best they can do under the circumstances, is theme parks. It isn't the cinema of human beings trying to convey emotional, psychological experiences to another human being. That has set off a firestorm on Twitter where people are all up in arms on both sides. People saying they agree with him that, yes, the Marvel movies and these superhero big budget movies are not, quote, cinema. While others are taking him to task for that and trying to make some parallels to even some of his own movies, uh, trying to make an argument for and against. And Francis Ford Coppola. Francis Ford Coppola yeah. chimed in as well, calling the, calling the Marvel movies despicable. So, all right, here's the thing. Are you going to list any of the people that uh, got mad at Scorsese, famous people, like James Gunn, director of well, Guardians Andy, of the Galaxy? Okay, 
coincidentally, everybody who's associated with Marvel films has come up in defense of the Marvel movies. Shocker. I, I wouldn't have expected that. Um, yes, James Gunn's come up in defense. Nobody's come out and been uh, uh, blasphemous to Mr. Scorsese or Mr. Coppola. I think everybody recognizes they are excellent directors. They have done so much to shape what we know as cinema today. Right. However, I think the idea of any director calling an entire genre of films where you have hundreds of people, craftsmen, actors, designers, animators, coming together to build a work of art, no matter how you feel about it personally, I think the labeling of saying that that's not cinema is absolutely trash, and I cannot stand that. So you think that comment is despicable? Yes, <laughs> I do. I actually do. I, 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 I just – it's one thing to say you don't like the movies, Okay, I can rattle off tons of movies that I do not like, but I'm never going to argue that those films are not cinema because somebody in that production is trying to tell an interesting story and convey emotional, psychological experiences. Even if it's a big budget, blow them up action film, there's still something to that. I just think these are, unfortunately, directors are, these directors probably have forgotten what it was like back in the 70s when they were getting started making films. And there were people out there maybe saying that their films weren't traditional cinema and giving them a lot of grief. It's not fair. So I'm, I'm upset about that. I'm not sitting here saying that the Marvel movies are the best that cinema has to offer these days. But I do think that they are still just as vital as any award-winning independent film that may be made or the Irishman coming out. They all play a part in cinema. So I'm, it just bothers me. I don't think directors in general or any filmmakers should be blasphemous towards a whole other subset of films just because it's not a kind of film they make or they want to see themselves. Gotcha. That's my take on it. I think it's in bad taste for directors to badmouth other films in general. You, know, you can say you don't like them, but to, to, to label it not cinema – call them despicable um, as a genre type, I think is really out of line. So Now, if he was talking about DC Universe, then... Oh, well, yeah, DC fine. Universe. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> that's, no, not even that. Listen, sure. I'm not going to sit here and say that DC comic uh, movies are not cinema. I don't like most of them, but they still have a part to play, and they are still the product of artists, you know? So I'm really big on this idea of films as art, you know, even if the art is not art you like. It's still art, you know? Art right. doesn't, as a definition, mean it has to be good for everybody. It just means it's an expression of somebody's, what they want to show on screen, what they want to write, what they want to direct, what they want to shoot, what they want to act. I don't know. I, I just thought that was really in poor taste. And I'm still going to watch The Irishman. I'm still going to say Goodfellas is one of my absolute favorite movies of all time. I still want to see Apocalypse Now again because it's been a while since I've seen it. So it doesn't diminish my view of any of their work. It's just I think it's a real shame that these guys who are true auteurs and understanding of how films, how how much effort it takes to make a good product in a film, especially a film that people like, mm -hmm. to trash an entire genre that has enamored millions of people across – I mean – there again, they're incredibly popular. People love those Marvel movies for the most part. You know, to trash that as in saying it's not cinema, I think is just in really poor taste. So that's my soapbox. Okay. Chris, do you have any response to that? Are you are you staying on the sidelines on this one? No, I mean I I guess I would say, you know, Martin Scorsese's comment, um surprising to me when I heard it and a little disappointing. Whereas Coppola's follow up I think is I would say is kind of shameful. Yeah. Um, no, I, his was worse than Scorsese. I, yeah, I was You're like, right. oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, here's the thing, and it, it I think, I mean, it, it just makes it just makes it be like you know movie snobs. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, what's well, fashionable to trash popcorn cinema like Marvel movies, DC movies, Transformer movies. It's like you know, it's popular to just bash on all that, but true art is something else. Yeah. And I don't, I don't feel like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's kind of a, a stupid hill to die on. Um, I okay. will agree that what's your definition of cinema, but one person's definition is different from another's. Yeah. And so, well, and you know, okay, we, we have trashed on 
some films before quite a bit. Actually, you even mentioned in your definite Transformers movies. That's, oh, yeah. that's like an easy punching bag. We sure. say, okay, we don't like those movies. I do not think they are good, well-made movies. They're not aspiring to anything more than being entertainment. But what's wrong with that? But what's, what's wrong, wrong with, with just being pure I still consider them cinema. Sure. I still consider them a work of art that a group of people came together and made. I mean, you can't argue the fact that there's a lot of work that went into making those movies. Absolutely. A lot of animators, a lot of designers, a lot of, you know, everything. You know, just because I don't like it and it's not a film I want to see again does not mean that it doesn't deserve to be treated as a film that people may choose to enjoy and see as their own work of art. So okay. it's also subjective. Yeah. So I guess what, what it's just upsetting when something so subjective like art, you've got such great artists taking a pot shot and saying, oh, well, we well, don't like those films, so they're not cinema. They're, they're despicable. They're to, bad. To come, and the despicable comment I can't get behind, but actually – if you told me somebody said the the byline was, um, let me think of what's what's one that's coming out um, Eternals by you know yeah. that's coming out you know in twenty. Mm-hmm. If you told me the byline on that was a you know like a thrill park or theme park roller coaster thrill ride or something, mm-hmm. and that was kind of the thing, I'd be like, oh well, that's exactly what I think that's supposed to be. It's supposed to be mm-hmm. a summer blockbuster action, you know. And usually there is a little bit more towards Marvel movies, like some of the end game stuff with Avengers. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, there's more themes going on there, but it is still kind of like a theme part ride. That's not a bad thing. No. So like, I guess I give a little bit more leeway to Scorsese, not saying that something's not cinema, but him saying it's a thrill part. I'm like, well, yes, I agree with that. That's what it is. You know, I disagree that that's, can't be cinema. Does yeah. that make sense? But I yeah, completely. Coppola just saying despicable and like no. shame on you. Go sit in the corner. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that, you know, you look at, okay. And just labeling it as an entire genre of movies have come out. Yeah. There's been 20 plus movies in the, in the Marvel universe. Yeah. I could argue a lot of them hit similar beats and play out similar uh, tones and styles. And, you know, it could be a little re- repetition involved in places, but I mean, I could also look at films in the seventies and find a whole, bunch of films that were very similar and repetitive with themes and styles. And Scorsese like seems to be awfully big on doing mafia stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and using some of the same songs in a soundtrack and some and of the same, same actors. You know, okay. and, yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I mean, just, you've got casino, mean streets, yeah, yeah. good fellas. You've got the Irishman coming. I mean, you know, so, anyway, so. I, I think it's just, I think it's, I, I just don't think artists should be, so disparaging about a whole nother set of uh, genre of their own art. And uh, that was really disappointing. So that's, that's what I was upset about. And uh, <laughs> thank you for letting me have a few minutes. Sure. To my thoughts on it. Um, still love you, Marty, Francis, still going to watch whatever you put out next. Cause you know, I think somewhere he's cited as being your favorite filmmaker. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I saw it was like overall body. Of overall work. Bo- yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, absolutely. And finding out my wife has never seen Goodfellas the other day Oof. was a big surprise to me. So now I've got to rectify that, maybe even this weekend. We'll okay, see. fair enough. So anyway, again, I'm not holding any of your uh, my, my, my feelings about your film and your work against you for what you said. But, guys, come on. Give it a break. You know, <laughs> just let's not tear each other down sure. and start a Twitter war, which is basically what Oh, had. yeah, it was huge. It was pretty bad. Okay, Chris, another source of a Twitter war, as always, Star Wars trailers. Okay. Um, episode 9. And I have not, I have avoided any of the commentary on said trailer. Okay. Fair enough. Episode nine is coming out December 20th. It is being billed as the final one of this saga. Alan, have you already bought your tickets? No, I have not. Okay. Have not yet. I'm going to be traveling. So I'm trying to figure out exactly how I'm going to pull this off. Yikes. Don't know exactly where I'm going to be on that day. Uh Uh-oh. So... Um, but what we're going to do, since Chris has been the one a lot better about not watching trailers than me, I unfortunately am still drawn to trailers like a moth to a flame. <laughs> <laughs> I hear there's a new Fair trailer enough. out for a film I want to see. I will go and watch it, and I will hate myself for watching it afterwards because it builds up expectations. I don't know if I can. it's going to live up to. But we did. I have seen the Star Wars trailer twice, so I have some observations already. Okay. Chris has not seen it, so we are going to play it. You're only going to hear the audio of the trailer, of course, because this is not a video podcast. But you're going to hear the audio of the whole trailer, and then when we come back, and you may even hear Chris's reaction on Mike. I don't know. Oh, dear. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> then we'll come back and just get some initial gut 
gut gut reactions. Okay. Fair enough? Yes. Here we go. I'm a little nervous. Okay, we get the Lucasfilm thing. Hmm. It's an instinct. together we're not alone good people will fight if we lead them people keep telling me they know me no one does Three PO. Taking one last look, sir. Oh dear. At my friends. So it's like the Lady Gaga moment from Star is Born. Confronting fear is the destiny of a Jedi. <laughs> Your destiny. Okay. Oh, that's unfortunate. I wish I hadn't seen that. The force will be with you. Always. Oh goodness. So much to uh so much to say. I'm going to say right off the bat that if you're like me and haven't seen this trailer yet, go ahead and skip this discussion. If you want to remain like spoiler free, I normally don't see trailers unless I'm in the theater and they come on. I won't go running out because I would embarrass my kids, but yeah, I wish I hadn't seen that a, and uh, yeah. So just skip ahead to you heal our recommendations. Cause that'll be okay. the next thing we'll be doing is giving recommendations. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There were some, there were some uh, painful, painful things in there. The the C three PO thing is is terrible. Now maybe in the content or in the context of the movie, yeah, it will be redeemable, possibly. Um, so that's my biggest misgiving. It just seems like a very Jar Jar Binks type thing, and like needlessly, you know, R two C three PO. They got to be in every movie, and it's kind of like the Stanley cameos that kind of got on my nerves. I'm so over that. Like, let's move on with the new characters. Let's put all the other characters behind. Let's move the freak on. And yeah, Ian McDermott's voice, which had his laugh had been teased in the prior trailer for this film. And now his like voiceover is like all over this thing. I will give it the benefit of the doubt. I still want to see this movie. I'm still excited to see this movie, but I feel like they're just, it's way too similar. Just like, um, Force, right. Awakens. Force Awakens was too similar, similar to the first to Star yeah. Wars. This is way too similar for me to Return of the Jedi and Ian McDermott playing the Emperor Palpatine. Like, and even first scene of the trailer is like a forest looking type place, like indoor. I mean, it's yeah. just. And Force Awakens, my initial take on that movie when I first saw it was like, I mean, yeah, it's well made and I like the new characters, but I wish they would do something different, you know? But then the second time I saw it, I liked it and I was like, I get the same. I get the same. Well, just from this. just as a little background in front, in case anybody's not aware, J.J. Abrams, the director of yeah. the Force Awakens, right. which is the film you were just commenting on, that felt very playing a lot of the same beats as the original Star Wars and New Hope, and kind of just playing off nostalgia a lot more than I think we would have liked. Right. You, Ryan Johnson directed the last Star Wars film, The Last Jedi. Now J.J. Abrams is back to direct this one. It was supposed to be Colin Trevorrow, but they fired him. After, so, 
after Solo or Rogue no, One? No, no, no. He did um, Rogue One. No, he 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 directed another film. Because um, Gareth Edwards did. Yeah, Gareth Edwards did Rogue One, and then Ron Howard, Howard did took so, it over. That's from, right. Uh, that's right. The the Lego people. Yeah, yeah. Miller and Lord. So yeah, right? Trevorrow just got fired because I think you know, <laughs> he made another. He did film. Jurassic World. He did Jurassic World, and then he did like his own film, and it was like pretty bad. And okay. Also, I don't know. There might have been some internal drama going on there too. Got you, got you. Anyway, so J.J. Abrams came back to write the ship and get episode nine done. My concern is when I heard J.J. Abrams was going to do it, is saying, okay, well, so we may have a repeat of some old themes once again. I'm hopeful. One thing about J.J. Abrams I'll say is that he does keep a lot of secrets close to the vest. Yeah, he um, was responsible for Lost. I mean, yeah, him yeah. and Damon Lamar. And generally yeah. his stuff, I mean, he, he, he does a lot of misdirection. Uh, it's very possible things we saw in the trailer were very much intended to be misdirection. I don't know. There's a shot. This is this was the one thing, the C-3PO thing, whatever. Um, the Ian McDermott thing, I'm, I'm bitter, but, but the one shot where I saw it and I was like, I wish I hadn't seen that. Yeah. Um, there again, if you didn't want this spoiled, you should have skipped ahead. Um, <laughs> but it is a shot of Ray and Kylo seemingly – fighting together, striking something down. That bothered me a lot that I saw that. That bothered me as much as if I had known, which I think you well, knew going into Phantom Menace that um, Qui-Gon Jinn got killed because you were looking at a soundtrack in a mall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you were like, yeah. wait, there's a song like Qui-Gon Dies. And like, oh, well, I guess <laughs> I know what's going to happen in hell? that scene. <laughs> yeah. And so seeing that, like, I mean, I hope I'm wrong. No, but like, I'll, I'll give it that. It's a cool scene. Cool shot in the trailer. Oh, it, no, it has and nothing it, to do with how it's yeah, shot. And it's it looks just, like it's actually, I mean, if I had to guess, it looks like it's in the Cloud City, like decor-wise, the bright white and all that. I don't know. I don't but know, again, man. yeah, it is one of those shots. But again, I don't know. I, I think I could look back at shots I remember seeing for Last Jedi in the trailer that out of sequence and in a trailer context. didn't really add up to the film we saw, which is good. So, gotcha. Anyway. So, Chris? You sound like you're maybe a little disappointed now you've watched it. Uh, yeah, but I was going to see like it anyway. Sounds like it might anyway. have diminished some of your, might have brought your expectations down just a tad. Which is probably good to have low expectations. I agree. Lower, I agree. lower the possible. Well, I've so already had lower, many, lower many conversations with a, a certain friend of the podcast uh, <laughs> about the fact that they're riding horses on a Star oh. Destroyer out in space. And you know. I, I did see, I, you know, I have avoided Twitter comments until just now um, having said, but I did see something about horses in the Star Wars universe. And now that I've seen the scene, yeah, there's like some galloping. Well, horses. and keep in mind that the last time we had those kind of galloping horse type of things were in last Jedi on the Canto bite sequence, which is generally kind of considered the uh, worst part of the film or the least uh, interesting part of the were film. Were they just straight up horses in that thing? I don't know what they were. Okay. They were some sort of creatures that looked like horses, okay. but uh, okay. so I don't know. Maybe there's some connection there. I'm not... Anyway, I don't even want to speculate on anything. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't explored any theories. I'm not thinking through anything. Got gotcha. you. I watch it just purely for the visceral reaction of how does it make me feel. Eh, worried. Is a little bit where I come from. What worries you the most? The whole emperor stuff. Yeah, yeah. That and uh, I, 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 I'm hopeful the the movie is not just going to be two hour closure goodbye. You know, we know this is the last one of this nine film saga, so let's just go for every emotional beat we can for two hours straight. Kind of have a feeling that may be at play at least for a good part of the running time. Wow, I'm a little worried about that. Yeah. I am worried about uh, the fact that I just feel like they're – I still am bothered by the name of the film. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I me just, too. I don't want to think that you know they're going to undo some of the things I think Ryan Johnson tried to do in Last Jedi with the story. So, right. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that was an interesting new segment. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, get a little stuff off our chest. Sure. You got to experience something that you probably maybe wish you had now. So yeah. Yeah, it's all right. Good. Well, let's move on to some things we can agree on that are going to be positive, things we there want to talk go. positively about. And that's our recommendations. This is the part of the show where Chris and I both have a film that we want to share as a recommendation, something we caught up with recently that we feel is worth your time and to tell you why. So, uh, Chris, how about I'll go first sure. since I got to hear you 
pine on about the trailer, and I'll give you a little bit of a chance to catch your breath and okay. calm down a little bit, and then I'll go <laughs> into mine. So my recommendation is the film uh, Between Two Ferns. Once again, another Netflix film. Seems to be a lot of Netflix films we're covering today. Mm-hmm. Between Two Ferns, starring Zach Galifianakis. Welcome to another edition of Between Two Ferns, and my guest today is Matthew McConaughey. Good to be here, Zach. Of all the things you can win an Oscar for, how surprised are you that you won one for acting? Here we go. I noticed that you're wearing a shirt. Is everything okay? And you have a major leak in here. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Let's see what's going on with these oh, dudes. Don't do that. So, for those of you not familiar, Between Two Ferns is a web series from several, many years back. It's actually been around a good while. Right. It's really kind of what Zach Galifianakis got known for about the time he was making the film The Hangover, the original one, and so on. And it's a series of web interviews where basically it's Zach Galifianakis playing himself, but playing a version of himself where he doesn't really know very much about the people he's interviewing and is putting together a very low-budget, cheap talk show. Between two potted ferns, uh, hence the between two ferns name. Hmm. So those have been wildly popular. They kind of put Zach Galifianakis on the map. Um, but it's been quite a while since they've done any of those new ones. And then they all of a sudden announced on Netflix they're going to have a movie version. Well, right away, you take the whole Saturday Night Live skit turning into a movie a formula. Normally it does not go well. Right. Normally that is not a positive thing to take a five minute sketch that people like in small doses and turn it into an hour and 20 minute film. This film, I will say knows that and doesn't even try to like avoid the fact that it is going to be still several of those between two foreign episodes, just loosely stitched together with some sort of storyline. Sure. So in that regard, it succeeds in that I will say, yeah, for this film, the, the best parts of this film are the actual sit-down interviews and with celebrities. man, are some of them good. I've seen they these, too. very, very good. To with, the point where I've gone back and watched some of those over again just because they're, they're so good. And some of the stuff that's left over till the credits when they're yeah. showing kind of oh, outtakes yeah. is some of the best <laughs> stuff, too. It's just... So, you um, know, for an hour, 20-minute running time, I'd say probably 45, 50 minutes of it is these Between Two Ferns segments, which is great. Sure. The other 30 minutes or so, 30, 40 minutes of the interstitials uh, acting between it is fine. Some of it's funny. Um, I will say, you know, some of the some of the people in the film, some of his cast, I think, are really are, are great. Um, I, I'm trying to pull up the names of the people that uh, – hold on. There's uh, – what's her name? Um, Lauren Lapkus mm-hmm. plays it. I have assistants, Carol. She's great. She's she is. really funny in this. Um Will Ferrell plays himself as kind of the the head uh, of funny or die, of funny or die, right. playing off that. So some of the Bart pins in between are funny, but you can tell, and I think they even kind of wink, wink, wink at the camera, like knowing, yeah, we're just coming up with a random storyline, kind of a ridiculous plot to stitch <laughs> together all these between two front interviews right. to have fun with it. So I think they they're in on the joke. They know it's a kind of a lame premise for it, but we're just going to have fun with it, and they do. So. I think for an hour, 20 minutes, it's a great use of your time. It's very funny. And like Chris said, some of these celebrity interviews are equally cringeworthy and funny uh, to watch. So, you know, not to go in too long with your recommendation, but if you had to pick what your favorite was, Matthew McConaughey, Peter Dinklage, Benedict Cumberbatch, Paul Rudd, Brie Larson, Keanu Reeves, John Hamm, um, what what would you chance the rapper? What would you say? Well, Keanu Reeves is my favorite. Oh man, is it? Yeah, yeah. It, it's Keanu pretty, Reeves is so good. It's pretty, Paul Rudd and no, some Paul of the Rudd's outtakes that yeah, are yeah. really good. But yeah, Keanu yeah. Reeves, as if he already hasn't had a resurgence. <laughs> some of the stuff, and it's not. It's it's a lot of what Zach Galifianakis is saying. Oh sure, but a lot of it's just Keanu Reeves, kind of like you know, his kind of the way he plays it is yeah, yeah. just. No, he, it was my favorite. It's the it's one. Good. There's a ex- slightly extended version of it on YouTube of that whole interview, and it's <laughs> it's really good. So it yeah, is. Keanu Reeves is my favorite, but I'd say several of them are really good. Um, some of them are really short. I mean, it's True. just like one question or one bit, and that's fine. It's like a montage of like some of the best bits. <laughs> sure. But uh, Matthew McConaughey gets a little more screen time. Uh, the Benedict Cumberbatch one goes on a little longer. It's pretty fun. <laughs> Uh, the Paul Rudd one has uh, got some time. John Hamm's on there. I think he's he's really good as yeah, well. So, yeah, yeah. It was some good stuff. So I'm I'm recommending. It's fun. 
don't go in expecting a full movie that's got like a big deep plot and character development or whatever. It's truly just an excuse to stitch together as many of these interviews as possible. So if you don't have Netflix and you were a little leery about spending $9 for one month just to watch Dolomite, you could consider renting or getting this as well. So then yeah, it would be true. 450 for this and 450 for Dolomite. So. Yeah, yeah. Now you're true. So it starts to make sense. Netflix, right. the math is working out. <laughs> To be able to, uh, to, to see it. Right. All right. So, Chris, great. So, that mine is Between Two Ferns, the movie, on Netflix right now. What is your recommendation? So, mine is going to be a dark comedy satire called The Art of Self-Defense. Karate is a way of communicating. Ask me a question. What are your plans for the weekend? I'm going to do some grocery shopping. And rent a film to watch in the comfort of my home. that answer your question? I want you to tell me why you're here. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of other men. I want to be what intimidates me. You came to the right place. So let me start off by saying this is a comedy. It is funny, but it is Dark. Okay. So dark this is comedy. not a, this is not a family film. Hence the term dark comedy. Right. I mean, it you know it, it definitely is dark, um, and I, I just really enjoyed it. I didn't know what to expect. I'd heard that it was good. Heard a little bit of buzz, but then it kind of came and went. And I saw it pop up on uh, in Apple Movies, so I was like, you know what, I'm going to rent this, and I'm so glad I did. Riley Starnes, who's the director, I believe we reviewed one of his films, the one prior to this, called Faults. Um, oh, right, right, so this right. Is, well, really this is the him. same director. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got uh, Jesse Eisenberg. You may have recognized his voice. He plays, and I know a lot of people probably shake their head, roll their eyes. He plays the kind of, you know, loser who feels like he's, you know, getting beat up all the time and is afraid of everything. So, but then he starts to try to protect himself by going to a karate class you know, and it's this is kind of an interesting commentary on masculinity, toxic masculinity, to be sure. Um, and the guy who plays Sensei, and that is his name in the movie, you never learn another name for him, it's just Sensei, is Alessandro Nivola. And I say that name, you're like, who? But yeah, I had seen him in some things, but never really paid that much attention to him. A lot of times I think he does play a bad guy. But he is so amazing in this film. He's been in a lot of films. Too. He has so been he's in like a lot one of those recognizable faces. faces. You just don't know the guy. Yeah, yeah, and he is. I mean, he he pretty much makes the film, which he has to be because you know Jesse Eisenberg is admiring him, and so his mm. character. So you kind of have to to believe the film. You kind of have to fall into like, oh yeah, this guy seems so together. He mm. knows what he's doing, and you know. Wow. Um, so really good. I uh, was really unsure where the movie was going at certain times. Um, like a lot where it ends. Mm-hmm. But I, I will say, yes, it's it's not for the kiddies. Well, but I, I really liked it. So Art of Self-Defense. Art of Self-Defense. And where can people see that? Just iTunes, so, Amazon? Yeah, it's, it's rentable right now. Not on Netflix yet. So I okay. can't justify a subscription so by using it. We didn't pull off an all-Netflix <laughs> no. show quite no, yet. No, we did so, not. All right. Yeah. Good. We're close. <laughs> We're sure. very, very close. So. All right, great. So that's our recommendations. We've got Between Two Ferns, the movie, and we've got The Art of Self-Defense. Then just kind of a reminder of the rest of the show, we gave uh, very, very positive reviews to the film Loose, which will be available fairly soon, I would imagine, for people to be able to see. Also a good positive review of the Netflix film Dolomite Is My Name. Uh, I am saying that Marvel movies are cinema. I'm going on record. You can quote me. Start your Twitter your Twitter feud right now off of my words. There you go. Um, but I still love Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola. And uh, Chris saw the new Star Wars trailer and has some concerns that we will wait hope, patiently another two months to see if they are warranted or not when the film comes out. So, Chris, if people have some thoughts, ideas, and opinions they want to share, how do they go about getting in touch with us? You can send us an email at info at the mesh.tv. Mention Foot Candle Films in the subject line and uh, tell us how we were wrong or right about any of the movies that we reviewed or some movies that you may feel like are lesser known. You can throw us some ideas for movies we might want to watch to give recommendations on future shows. Yeah, absolutely. So please let us know your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you and lo- any recommendations of other films to be talking about or checking out in the future as well. Uh, you know, we 
You won't be here to talk about the film festival for a little while because we just finished up the one uh, about a month or so ago for 2019. But I, we will say that if you are a filmmaker and you have a film that is either finished now or has been finished in the past year and you'd like to submit it for our festival, they can do that as of November 1st. November is that right? 1st. And also, not only films, but we're also going to be accepting feature length scripts as well. So right. both of those ideas, you know, if you're scriptwriter or a filmmaker and you want to submit November 1st the floodgate opens so that's films the films themselves can be short films or feature length films Correct. the scripts are feature length feature length, feature length scripts okay mm-hmm. and it can be documentaries or, or or narrative for the films that are submitted as well right. so November 1st if you go visit footcandle.org we'll have a button on that website leading you to the festival page or just go straight to the festival site, footcandlefilmfestival.com, and we'll make sure we have buttons leading everywhere to where you need to go to submit those. And the earlier you do it, the less expensive the fees are, so it's a good thing to go ahead and do. Correct. And if you're already on the platform that we use just as kind of inside baseball is Film Freeway, so you can also find our listing there. Our next festival will be in September of next year, so you've got quite a ways. Correct. But, again, well, we encourage you to go ahead and submit your film early, or uh, spread the word and help help people know that the the films are available for submission now, and we'll be announcing next year's films um, probably July, yeah, about July time mm-hmm. frame of uh, two twenty twenty. It'll be the twenty twenty film festival. Yeah, so yeah. very exciting. Can we avoid using any type of like optician equipment? For Probably optometry not. equipment for the design. I think you're design. kind of required to. I mean, isn't that going to be all like design yes. for 2020? Is all going By to the that? end of 2020, we're going to be so sick of <laughs> oh eyeglasses <gosh. laughs> and visual totally. icon, uh, icons with, with eyeglasses or contact totally. lenses or whatever. So, yes. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up today's show. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We appreciate it. Please, as always, send us any feedback or thoughts you may have. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you at the next episode. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.